Good evening and welcome to the Dali Museum. Um, we're so happy to have you here this evening for a special lecture, Finding Polly Murray, Her Legacy Lives On. Polly Murray was a feminist icon and a co-founder of the National Organization for Women. And we are gonna hear about her many accomplishments from perhaps the best representative. Um, Tony Van Pelt is a longtime feminist and secular humanist who served as the president of the National Organization for Women from 2017 to 2020. She has also held positions of president of the NOW Foundation and chairwoman of the NOW Political Action Committee and served as the principal spokeswoman for all three entities. Van Pelt oversaw NOW's multi-issue agenda, achieving constitutional equality for women, advancing reproductive rights and justice, promoting racial justice, stopping violence against women, winning civil and human rights for the LGBTQIA plus community, and ensuring economic justice. Van Pelt has served in leadership positions at all levels of NOW. In addition, she co-founded the Institute for Science and Human Values, along with Paula Kurtz in 2010. She served as the treasurer, president, and chairwoman, retiring in 2021. She served as vice president of the Center for Inquiry from 2004 to 2009, which encompasses the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and the Council for Secular Humanism. In 2006, she established the first public office for the secular humanist movement in Washington, DC. The Center for Inquiry's Office of Public Policy continues to serve as liaison to our nation's government to see that every available means is used to defend and promote science, reason, and secular values, working with lawmakers to effect legislative responses to attacks on science and reason. And she currently serves on the board of the Institute for Humanist Studies. And tonight, she's going to join us um, to deliver a lecture on Polly Murray and tell us a little bit about the person who was the co-founder of the organization that she later came to serve at the helm of. So please join me in welcoming Tony Van Pelt. Thank you so much for those kind words, and um, I'm very happy to be with you all tonight. Anna Pauline Murray was born November 20th in 1910 in Baltimore, Maryland. She was the fourth of six children. She was an African civil rights activist who was arrested for refusing to sit in the back of the bus on a Greyhound bus in a broken seat. 15 years before Rosa Park. She organized sit-ins at restaurants in Washington, D.C. 20 years before the Greensboro, North Carolina sit-ins. She was one of the most important thinkers and legal scholars of the 20th century, serving as a bridge between the civil rights and women's rights movements. And she was a co-founder of the National Organization for Women. She declared, the discovery that men I deeply admire because of their dedication to civil rights could continence exclusion of women aroused an emerging feminism in me long before I knew the meaning of the term feminism. And yet today, not many would recognize the name of the Reverend Dr. Polly Murray let alone her indelible impact on American law, civil rights, and women's rights. As a black, queer, feminist woman, Polly Murray was almost completely erased from the historical narrative. Murray's life and remarkable accomplishments came back into focus as the National Trust for Historic Preservation designated her childhood home in Durham, North Carolina a National Historic Landmark. The summer of 2016 brought major restoration work to the badly dilapidated home, the modest structure that was built in 1898 by her maternal grandfather, a Union Civil War veteran. It now serves as the home for the Polly Murray Center for History and Social Justice. Ms. Murray, was a great granddaughter of enslaved persons, a talented poet, an autobiographer and historian, a perceptive social commentator, a dedicated political activist, 
a, co a compassionate attorney, an inspiring professor, a brilliant legal theorist, the vice president of Benedict College in South Carolina, the first person to teach African American studies and women's studies at Brandeis University, and a groundbreaking female Episcopalian priest. Add to that list, she was dedicated a saint of the Episcopalian Church in 2012, 27 years after her death. A feminist saint, Polly was truly a trailblazer. The accolades do not end there. She was a friend and faithful correspondent of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who did much to encourage the work of Polly. Polly, in her turn, heightened the First Lady's awareness of the challenges faced by working women, poor people, and communities of color. Polly's status was such that she became a consultant to Presidents Franklin D. Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy. Born into a family lineage that included free blacks, African-American enslaved people, Native Americans, and white slave owners, she escaped family struggles racial and sexual discrimination and poverty through education. Polly's mother died of a cerebral hemorrhage when she was four years old. When her father was unable to care for the couple's six children, Polly moved to Durham, North Carolina to live with her aunt. Her father had become emotionally unstable following a bout with typhoid fever and was committed to a mental institution. When she was 13 years old, Polly's father was beaten to death with a baseball bat by a white guard at a Maryland State Hospital. The road to higher education was a bumpy one for her. She moved to New York City after graduating high school at the head of her class in Durham. In order to receive, as a resident of New York State, free entrance to Hunter College, she earned another high school diploma in Queens in 1927. Murray attends Hunter College for two years, and inspired by a teacher, she attempts to enroll at Columbia University. Polly was turned away because she, they did not admit women at Columbia. Back at Hunter, Murray published an article and several poems in the college newspaper and an essay about her maternal grandfather, which in 1956 became a memoir, Proud Shoes about her mother's family. Polly graduated in 1933 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in English. Polly married Billy Wynn in 1930. She found that she was not attracted uh, to men. She was repelled by sex with men, and so they only lived together for a few months. She had the marriage annulled in 1949. After graduation, she was employed by the Depression Era Works Projects Administration and the Workers' Defense League, and she taught remedial reading in the New York City school system. She also took a job with the National Urban League, selling subscriptions to their academic journal. But poor health forced her to resign, and she was encouraged by her doctor to move to a healthier climate. She moved to the Catskills to assume a position at Camp Terra, which was disparagingly referred to at the time as a she-she-she conservation camp in comparison to the male CCC or the Civilian Conservation Corps. Polly's health improved during her three months at the camp. It was the first time that she met Eleanor Roosevelt, which led to a life-changing friendship. In 1938, Polly applied to the University of North Carolina, but was refused entrance because of her race. All public schools and facilities in North Carolina were segregated. The NAACP considered filing a lawsuit on her behalf, but decided against it because there was a question of her state residency. In 1941, she began attending Howard University Law School, an historic black college the only female in her class. On Murray's first day of class, one of her professors, William Ming, remarked that he did not know why women would attend law school. This was the beginning of the discriminatory and insulting treatment she experienced from male faculty. She was infuriated. She describes the hoots of insulting laughter she suffered when she suggested to her classmates 
that the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, which upheld racial segregation state laws as constitutional under the separate but equal doctrine of 1896, was inherently immoral and discriminatory and on those grounds should be overruled. Yet she didn't let that stop her. Murray coined the term Jane Crow, alluding to Jim Crow, the system of racial discriminatory state laws oppressing African Americans to describe the sexism she suffered from her male classmates and professors. She led student protests and co-founded the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, in 1942. She focused her studies on civil rights and wrote her theses on laws excluding people based on race. Despite sexual op obstacles to education, in 1944, she graduated first in her class, was the valedictorian of her Howard University law class, producing the senior theses, should the civil rights cases and Plessy be overturned. She was elected the Chief Justice of the Howard Court of Peers, the highest student position at Howard University. The University of Carolina, North Carolina's refusal to admit her due to her sex would not be the last time that she experienced this type of discrimination. Murray won a fellowship when she graduated from Howard that allowed her to apply to Harvard Law School for graduate work, as many of her fellow graduates did. Franklin D. Roosevelt sent Harvard's president a letter of recommendation for Murray, but the law faculty voted to accept Murray was tied seven to seven, thus denying her entrance. 20 years later, Murray speaking on the Harvard campus joked that she had earned her Bachelor of Feminism degree with that experience. Polly moved west to do postgraduate work at Bolt Hall of Law at University of California, Berkeley, where she wrote her master's thesis, The Right to Equal Opportunity in Employment, arguing that the right to work is an inalienable right. In 1945, she earns her graduate degree in law. Her thesis was published in the California Law Review. Passing the California bar exam, Polly was hired as the first black deputy attorney general in 1946 in California. And she was named Woman of the Year by the National Council of Negro Women and Mademoiselle Magazine in 1947. The late Supreme Court Justice, then NAACP Chief Counsel Thurgood Marshall, called her 1950s book, State's Laws on Race and Color, the Bible for civil rights lawyers. The Bible was especially useful in the groundbreaking 1954 Brown versus Board of Education case. State's Law was an examination of and critique of state segregation laws throughout the country. Murray drew on psychological and sociological evidence as well as an innovative legal argument for which she, has been for which she had been previously criticized by her law, her law professors at Howard. She argued, argued civil rights lawyers should challenge segregation laws as unconstitutional rather than trying to show the inequality of separate but equal. Upon graduation in 65, Murray, Murray became the first African American to receive a JSD degree, making her the first African American to be awarded a doctorate in law from Yale University. The Doctor of Juridical Science degree is a highly specialized research doctorate in law designed for those seeking to pursue careers as teachers and scholars of law. In 2017, Yale University named a residential college for the Reverend Dr. Polly Murray, the Polly Murray College. Murray had a lasting impact on American feminism, beginning with a George Washington Law Review article, Jane Crow and the Law, Sex Discrimination in Title VII. She co-authored 
with lawyer Mary Eastwood, another co-founder of the National Organization for Women in 1965. The article discussed Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as it applied to women and drew comparisons between discriminatory laws against women and Jim Crow laws. Both Murray and Eastwood were discouraged by the failure to enforce Title VII's prohibition of sex discrimination in employment by, title, by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, which consisted of seven men. And the refusal at the Third National Conference of State Commissions on the Status of Women to consider a simple resolution that recommended the EEOC carry out its legal mandate to end sex discrimination in employment. In her autobiography, Song in a Weary Throat, Murray reports actions which took place as a result of the conference refusal to consider the resolution, prompting the founding of NOW. Betty Friedan, Murray, and Eastwood were among a group of 20 gathered at a table where the conference dignitaries were speaking and carried on in a whispered conversation about a temporary body to be called the National Organization for Women. Betty Friedan scribbled the organization's purpose on a paper napkin while sitting next to Murray, who stated, three months later, 32 of us set up the permanent organization of now, never dreaming that within less than two decades, it would have more than 200,000 members and become a potent force in American politics. Murray has been identified as one of the most pivotal figures in the 20th century American legal history. Her legal scholarship and activism hold a continuing national significance in African American civil rights and the women's movement's history. As a board member of the ACLU, Murray co-wrote alongside Dorothy Kenyon the brief on White versus Crook in 1966 which struck down the all-white, all-male jury system in Alabama as unconstitutional. This case is regarded as a turning point in civil rights law. Murray's legal scholarship laid the groundwork for Ruth Bader Ginsburg's argument in Reed versus Reid, the finding that the preference the finding that the preference for males as a state administrators was unconstitutional in 1971. This marked the first time that the Equal Protection Clause would be applied to a case of sex discrimination, prohibiting differential treatment based on sex. Prior to Reed versus Reed in the 1960s, Murray began to argue that the Equal Protection Clause should be applied in cases alleging sex discrimination as it was applied in cases of race discrimination. This analogy to race was intended to make clear women's subordinate status and to expose discrimination doubled by sex and race against black women. Murray wrote to Mrs. Roosevelt as a 28-year-old budding writer to point out the injustices of racial discrimination in the South remembering that she had been denied admission because of her race to graduate school at the University of North Carolina. Mrs. Roosevelt wrote back, I have read the copy of the letter you have sent me and I understand perfectly, but changes come slowly. The South is changing, but don't push too fast. Murray continued to share with the lady, the first lady in letters and in personal meetings at the White House and Roosevelt's New York City apartment her views about race, women, law, and inequality. Polly Murray was unambiguously and vocally queer. She wore pants and was candid about her relationship with women. In 1956, while working as the only woman in the litigation department at a law firm, Murray met her life partner, Irene Barlow, the firm's office manager. She was open about being a gender non-conforming person who cut a masculine figure in early adulthood. In this respect, Polly was far ahead of her time. By the 1950s, 
Murray was well established as a pro prominent civil rights attorney. Concerns about her work on behalf of civil rights and a past participation with the Communist Party eventually made her a target of McCarthy's Red Scare. Polly moved many, removed many of the references to her same-sex relationships in her writings from this point onward. Between her queerness, her gender, and her political beliefs, Murray fell victim to the respectability politics of the period and was erased from most chronics of the civil rights movement. Polly had grown up in the Episcopalian church and remained a faithful member throughout her adult life. In 1973, following the death of her longtime partner, Miss Barlow, Murray left a tenured position as professor of law and politics at Brandeis University to become a candidate for ordination at General Theological Seminary. After earning a master's in divinity degree, she was ordained in 1977 becoming the first African-American woman to become an Episcopalian priest. Reverend Murray performed her first Holy Eucharist in the same North Carolina chapel where her grandmother, an enslaved baby, had been baptized. In 2012, the General Convention of the Episcopalian Church voted to name Polly Murray as one of its holy women, holy men celebrating the saints. On each anniversary of her death, July 1st, a service is held to honor her as a saint for her advocacy of the universal cause of freedom and as the first African-American female priest ordained by the Episcopalian Church. Polly died in 1985 in Pittsburgh. Perhaps the most fitting remark to sum up Polly Murray's life was made by DC congressional delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton in her introduction for Murray's autobiography. She wrote, Murray never lived in the past. She lived decades ahead of her time. She lived on the edge of history, pulling it along with her. Few women, indeed few people, have left a legacy that continues to benefit millions. She was truly a woman who broke the boundaries society set for her. Thank you very much for allowing me to share her story with you this evening. Thanks. I don't. Know, I know that we have time, so if anybody has a question, I might be able to answer. Just go ahead. Yes, sir. You mean Polly or Eleanor? Polly. I think that the thing that's most important I know to me and for many, many women is that she, and for many African Americans, is that she merged the two of them. She brought forward how sex discrimination and racial discrimination were of the same cut. And she brought that forward legally and into our culture. And intersectionality, you hear that word now, intersectionality over and over again. Polly Murray was the living being of intersectionality. That's who she was. Anybody else? I just have been thinking about how she was so fearless and dauntless in pushing back against the sexism and the racism that she faced, but she didn't seem to rise to the occasion with, with, uh, with gender and sexuality. And she did live long enough to see, uh, you know, the Mattachine Society and Daughters of Elias and, and uh, Stonewall, for that matter. But you said something that that was new to me. That but I thought that she, it looked like she had pretty much excised everything about her relationships from her writings and what she. She did. It, you know, when McCarthy came along in the Red Scare, 
that was it she just started she just focused on the law and you're right and then I think that it was a safety issue uh, you know I definitely think it was a safety issue and I also think that she decided that you know the academic work and, and the legal work that she was doing was so important um, I mean how much can one person do in one lifetime yeah. you know I mean she just did so much and in her early years, she was very, very out, uh, which was very unusual in those days. I mean, remember, she was born in 1910, you know? She didn't die until 1985, and I can't remember. Did Stonewall happen in the 60s, right? Yeah, so by... Yeah, 68. So by then, she was, she was not focused on that any longer. Anybody else? No? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time.